Good morning and welcome to the CABE webinar for Wednesday 21st of September. Today we are looking at overcoming, overcoming the challenges of economically reusing or restoring historical buildings. This can present many challenges for the owners, design teams and wider society. The presentation will explore both the technical and non-technical challenges involved. My name is Rosemary and I'm the Regional Services Coordinator here at CABE and I'll be acting as moderator for this morning's session. We'd like to make our webinars interactive, so we do encourage you throughout the session to send in any questions as we go along, which we will address with a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If you're watching us live, you can use the side panel to send in your questions. The speaker will hold the section at the end of the webinar. Alternatively, you can get in touch with us via the social links that are now on screen. Let me introduce you to today's webinar speaker, David Humphreys, the Group Director for ACP, the Architectural Cons Conservation Professionals. And David has over 30 years experience in both public and private practice in Ireland, Australia and the UK. He has advised on projects in India, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Myanmar and Hong Kong for government and private projects. He's a Chartered Building Surveyor, Chartered Building Engineer, Chartered Project Manager, Chartered Landscape Architect and a Chartered Environment environmentalist and has won many awards for his work. So if you give me a couple of seconds we will uh, pass over to David and he will um, take you forward. Thank you. Welcome everyone. I believe um, that we have people from all over the world, uh, the UK, the Far East, um, Ireland um, and it's really wonderful. Um, I gave a talk similar to this uh, to the Malaysian conference in May and uh, I believe it, it was very well received. So, uh, without any further ado, I'd like to move, move along. Um, just very briefly on myself, uh, Rosemary has ticked the boxes there. I, I'm the director, founding director of the ACP Group, which is a multidisciplinary building conservation practice um, that I established in 2000 after spending uh, eight years um, with English Heritage and uh, we're we specialist we specialist staff. We focus totally on historic buildings. Um, we specialist staff in terms of surveyors, conservation engineers, conservation architects, conservation archaeologists, archaeologists, and so on. And we're accredited um, by the RICS, the SCSI, and RIBA, um, all of which are internationally recognised. Uh, our headquarters is in Ireland, and we have offices in. Uh, Singapore and in Newfoundland. Uh, we've done a significant amount of work in, in Newfoundland in Canada. And also we're starting to uh, work on projects in, in the South, Southeast Asian region. So the outline of the talk, um, I really want to focus on the difference between historic buildings and modern buildings and why they're different, because it's a question that comes up all the time. Um, they're they're very very different, and that presents uh, very very different economic challenges in terms of their reuse. And in in my experience, um, many many younger engineers and architects and surveyors and professionals in the the built heritage, um, in in the building industry essentially, are not being trained in their training in colleges. Uh, in, in anything to do with the older historic buildings. They know very little about masonry, they know nothing about um, old timbers. And when we take on graduates um, or even interns from colleges, which we do quite a lot from all over the world, um, we find that they almost have to start from scratch. So it's it's a, a deficit or a, a, a gap in, in, in the education. And there is a huge percentage of our built heritage, our built buildings, are of traditional materials. So the, the, the question of the economics comes down to, an, um, is it economically viable? And there's all sorts of um, criteria that comes into that, whether it's to do with government grants, whether it's to do with taxation, whether it's to do with, um, Finding an actual use of it that is economic. Um, people all or all the time say to me, Oh, wouldn't that building make a lovely restaurant or a lovely coffee 
place. And I'm beginning to think like, well, there's so many coffee places, for example, in our local city in Limerick that I don't think there's room for any more. Um, and then we have the, the, the interesting issue of uh, just what words mean. Um, the word restoration means something different in, uh, in Canada than in Ireland, than in the UK, than in Southeast Asia. So we have to understand the differences in, in these particular ones. These four particular buildings, just in this, um, present the different challenges. Uh, the building here on the top left um, is a, a commercial building in the center of St. John's in, in Newfoundland in Canada. Um, has always been uh, occupied, rented out space in very good condition. And we were asked to do a, a structural inspection of it because they were having some um, quite serious water ingress uh, that was beginning to have a, a serious effect on, on the building. Um, and the in, in St. John's in, in Canada, uh, in Newfoundland, um, there's a great uh, amount of, a large amount of timber frame buildings, uh, but masonry buildings um, are not that plentiful there. So the, the understanding of them would not be as good as we would have here in, in Ireland. Um, the building on the top right, uh, quite a, a fabulous building in uh, St. John's. Uh, it was a former Masonic Lodge built in the late 19th century. Um, the saints been taken over and is now being used by um, a local um, business where they use con their own concerts, their own social events and so on. And it's a very, very interesting um, and successful model for the reuse of a building such as this. This building um, presents all sorts of other difficulties in that it's, um, it's brick. It's on a very, very high, highly exposed um, part of St. John's. Um, there's been massive weather damage. The brick originally were imported from Lancashire in England, and uh, there are still boxes of the original brick down in the basement. So that, that building presents, presented us with some very, very different challenges, um, primarily because of the weather. But um, its reuse and the adaptation of the building is something that has worked out very, very well. The small building on the left bottom here is one that uh, we won an award for last year. It's a gate lodge into uh, a large estate, a former estate in, in the southwest of Ireland. Um, it had been completely abandoned, derelict, and so on. And the local community um, asked us to do some feasibility work on it, which went down, went down quite well. And uh, eventually they got um, support from the local authority and that building uh, was completely refurbished, new services put in, uh, the layout internally adapted to suit uh, a community facility. And that building now has got a real um, local use. It's fully up, fully in use and uh, it's got a future. The building on the, the right hand side, um, owned by a Chinese businessman, um, it's a very, very old hotel. It's small hotel. It was originally a private house uh, going right back into the, um, was the 16th to 15th century and even some earlier parts maybe there um, dating back to earlier periods. But the, the real issues here, it's a, a listed building in UK parlance or a Texas structure in Irish nomenclature. And the real issue here was how do we deal with um, making this economically viable because of the huge practicalities of trying to make a fire safe. And we had major problems uh, trying to work out a solution, but we ultimately came up with a solution with using a combination of fire suppression system and compartmentation. And that has worked out very, very well. Uh, and that, that building now is going through um, a number of new iterations of what its future is. So, Let's look at the differences, and I think this is very important for us to start at all, um, between historic buildings and modern buildings. Um, if we take them under the, the, the categories that we have here, um, 
from a design point of view, historic buildings tend to come from some form of tradition, whether it's Grecian, Roman, Islamic, colonial, Southeast Asian, various traditions. Um, obviously, your vernacular, local um, traditions that influence it. And many of the vernacular buildings are very, very low tech, which I think is to their advantage. Versus modern buildings, the design drive here is we need to be energy saving, we need to drive for carbon neutral, we need to maximize the space, we need to have every innovation that we can think possible brought into it, we need to have high technology, we need to have um, wireless, Wi-Fi, and so on. Um, all of that is a completely different approach, and the type of expertise you need is obviously very different. The materials in historic buildings tend to be natural materials, whether they're organic or inorganic materials. It can be stone, brick, timber, bamboo, uh, reed, uh, stick, uh, mud and plaster, and so on. And there is a whole series of traditional crafts that are built up around these. Whereas modern buildings tend to be made of steel, glass, aluminium, concrete, all sorts of synthetic materials, engineered materials such as engineered wood, mechanical electrical systems, um, huge amount of, of uh, ducting communication systems going through these buildings. Uh, again, different, different scenario, different materials. So in terms of the labor required, um, traditional historic buildings need skill trades. Many, many cases, uh, such as in, in England, you would have uh, intergenerational trades, father passing it on to son, passing it on, so on, down the, the generations. Uh, not so much that in Ireland, many of those skills have uh, been lost, probably frowned upon as well in, in that, you know, it, it was seen as, oh, a trade isn't as good as a university education. I think that has been turned on its head. Many, many young people now are looking at learning um, skills in historic buildings. There's a big revival on them. Uh, there's also the unskilled um, side of, of the labor that's required in terms of you know, mixing and carrying on that. Most of them, the labor would have been local and it would be their own traditionals. And um, you have the construction labor, and then of course you have the labor that was used in terms of use and maintenance and so on. Because in modern uh, situation, you have, it's almost like an, in, an industrial type of skill that's required. Um, technical skills of a very high quality are needed. Factory robotics are all taking part in, in the building and manufacturing of modern, um, modern buildings. So there's almost a, a huge, there is a huge requirement for a highly skilled during construction, but also in terms of maintenance and for the full life cycle. If something goes wrong with um, the mechanical electrical system, um, you need someone that's you know, really highly skilled, able to come along, patch in with their laptop and uh, sort out the problem. In terms of the environment, which I think is more and more important, we begin to realize now that um, historic buildings are require low energy. Many, many of the materials are locally sourced. There's a low environmental impact, which ticks many of the sustainability models. There's the whole issue and question of the amount of embodied energy that is um, within our historic buildings. It's already there. Many of these materials, many of these buildings are adapted to the local environment. Uh, they were designed with local materials, adapted to the local environment, and if maintained well, many, many of these buildings last for hundreds and hundreds of years. Much of the materials would have been recycled. Uh, we find in, in all over the, the world where we work um, that on a masonry wall, you might find that um, part of that, the, the stone or the brick, whatever, was recycled and taken from another building. And it's very interesting. And the same with timber. In terms of modern uh, materials and the impact on the environment, you're talking about a huge impact in terms of extractive industries. 
Uh, what's the impact of um, buying a piece of aluminium? Well, it has to be dug out of the ground at some great expense and environmental cost somewhere, probably in Canada, shipped to some place in Europe where it's processed and various other processes. And eventually it comes as your aluminium door, your aluminium um, window, whatever it is. Um, and then of course, we have a, the question of recycling. Um, much of our, mater our modern materials can be recycled, but many of them, it's a little bit more difficult. Other aspects, um, our historic buildings are a de depository or a, a place where our, our culture is recorded, our history is recorded, the various traditions of the local areas and our national traditions and international traditions are all recorded in our historic buildings. Uh, they generally tend to be more lower maintenance, um, and they are, the, many, many people would say to me, there's something different about them. There's more of a, a more welcoming um, type of uh, environment created by historic buildings. Um, in modern situations, we're talking of return on investment. Uh, all, the, all of our, our models are kind of pushing on this. Um, we have new technology constantly being introduced, um, upgrade this, upgrade that. Um, mass high costs of maintenance, and of course you have obsolescence all the time. And, and at times I wonder how many of our um, new timber frame buildings um, that are being built right across, uh, let's say in Ireland, uh, will be around in 50 years. I don't know. Um, but certainly many of the buildings that um, were built three, four, five hundred years ago, and even 200 years ago, are still around and been living in. <clears throat> so the challenges I see them break into technical and non-technical. Um, one particular, on the technical side, let's go down through them. There's a lack of an appreciation of the technologies, the old technologies. And one of the striking ones is historic iron. Um, Many people think that historic iron, whether it's cast or wrought, um, is you treat it almost like steel, and they're completely different materials. Um, you have to work with uh, historic iron the same as a traditional blacksmith would have worked, otherwise uh, you run into major problems. Uh, availability of the many many materials, uh, whether it's availability of good quality wood. Um, good quality iron recycled is probably there's no wrought iron been made anymore that I know of in, in Ireland or in the UK and anything that's available now is recycled. Uh, the availability of good quality stone or good quality brick um, in, some, in some cases many of the old quarries and the brick places of brick are manufactured are um, shutting down. Um, and you can find, you can get uh, brick, all right, but much of it is, um, it's not clay, it's made up of uh, something like uh, an ordinary Portland cement with uh, aggregate in it. <clears throat> the other technical issue is environmental relationship with materials. Traditional buildings worked with the environment. For instance, in terms of dealing with water, they would allow the water, or the water and the water vapor to come into the building, into the, the material, and then would evaporate off. Um, whereas our modern buildings, um, where in, in terms of dealing with water, um, we're all the time putting up waterproof barriers. So we have what, what um, damp proof courses, um, vapor barriers, and so on. Whereas the traditional materials dealt with it in a natural way, and if maintained properly, work very, very successfully. There's also the availability, the lack of availability of professions, of the professionals, um, conservation engineers, conservation architects, conservation surveyors, um, with uh, a high level of skills in the various aspects of traditional buildings, um, tend not to be that plentiful. And you also have the uh, scarcity in terms of traditional skill sets, good quality tradesmen. And that are really proud of their work, that um, have a proper attitude to doing what they're doing and very proud of it. Not, not easily available. 
uh, in many cases. <clears throat> you also have the, the economic modeling that tends to be used in, in um, how decisions are made with all the buildings, and indeed modern buildings. You have the return on investment throughout the life cycle of a, a building. Um, we need to bear in mind that the life cycle of a historic building is not just 20, 40, 40 years. It's potentially hundreds of years. And that needs to be taken account in, in the financial models. And also that we have the whole question of embodied energy in these traditional buildings. On the other two other uh, areas um, on the technical side is the fire engineering requirements um, can be problematic. Um, finding fire engineering solutions and um, for traditional buildings, but it's workable, giving, uh, given enough time and uh, being, um, what I would say is just being innovative in how you how you deal with it. Uh, there are lots of solutions and uh, historic buildings can be made fire safe. Energy efficiency requirements as well. Um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of, I would say misinformation probably out there about the um, energy efficiency of traditional materials. Uh, I was talking to a lady yesterday about um, the energy efficiency of cob and she had read somewhere, I don't know where, but that cob is um, not a, a very good insulator. And um, I was saying to her, well, look, walk right, kept dry, um, treated properly with uh, a lime render on the outside and inside. Cob is an extremely good uh, material for dealing with the weather and also dealing um, a very good insulator. So on the, the non-technical side, <clears throat> I'd say we, we have this whole, almost like a, a modern thing called consumerism. We need to be consuming all the time. We need more and more and more of something. And, um, that, that presents certain problems in historic buildings because the more that we want to put into them, uh, the more conflicts we tend to have between modern uh, technologies and traditional technologies. Project financing can be a problem. Um, trying to find a model where uh, it's economic to um, finance a project, um, getting insurance and so on, sometimes can be a problem. This is one that's particularly um, concerns me is that the, the attitude of planning authorities, um, and it varies considerably depending on where you're working, but that tends to be more carrot than, sorry, less carrot and more stick. Um, you have to do this. Um, and in, in, in I sometimes question whether the actual legislation that's in place to protect historic buildings, such as uh, Part 4 of the Planning Act in Ireland, um, is actually probably in some cases working against it because of the way it's been implemented or been interpreted. And I come across so many people um, that say to me, oh my God, if that's a listed building or a protected structure, they won't let me do anything. And of course, that's so, so untrue. Um, but that kind of um, attitude, we need to change that because it works against historic buildings when the authorities have this, um, well, it, it's out there that, you know, they're not going to let me do this, that or the other thing. And that, that, that's very negative. Um, we need to be able to deal with stakeholders. Uh, and many, many people have unrealistic expectations of historic buildings. And then you have the local friends group who um, have certain influences on what's going on. And these are some, these are part of, of what uh, conservation professionals and owners need to deal with and deal with it proactively in, in a positive way. There's also the public perception that needs to be dealt with. Sometimes the, the, the most um, economically viable new use is often the original use. Um, no, that's not always the case, but generally historic buildings were built for a particular use, such as a family home um, or a place of worship or whatever. Um, and that generally tends to be 
the use that is best for them. And then we're left with the question, if there is no obvious viable reuse for a building, what do we do? Do we ignore it? Do we abandon it? Do we level it? Start off with a new brownfield site? These are questions that, that need to be properly addressed and answered. Um, there's, no, there's no standard answer on this. That it's, each case has to be taken on, on its merits and looked at um, very, very seriously. And then, of course, there's the lack of knowledgeable decision makers, uh, particularly in the, the uh, public authority side of stuff. And the default position is they go back and they fall for the book, what it says in the book. And of course, the book, whatever the book is, uh, can only be um, so and only talk about the particular projects that was dealing with. But these are the non technical issues. So sometimes, as a conservation professional, a conservation engineer, conservation surveyor, I spend a lot of time dealing with the non technical stuff, educating people, bringing, working with them, and getting their support and um, getting them to a point where they actually realize we have really something special here. And then they start getting, oh my God, we have to save this building and we have to find a solution rather than, oh, it's just a, a more of a problem. So let's look at the Iron Sweater uh, Market case study. Um, this particular building, uh, I looked at it in 2017 uh, with my client. Um, it was, it's in a very, um, important part of the center of Galway city and the right in the heart of the, the retail area at the end of one of the busiest shopping streets in, in, in Galway. And it had been abandoned and let fall down and get into a very, very serious decay for probably 10 plus or more years. Um, as we walked through the building, we began to realize that it has been around uh, for many, many hundreds of years. And um, the last, this is what it, it was when we saw it. That gable was ready to collapse and been propped up and shored up. Um, it was an, a, an absolute terrible state. So just very, very quickly, uh, Galway City is an old fishing, was originally an old fishing village uh, around the, the, the River Corrib. Uh, it grew. And eventually uh, it became a walled city and then it expanded outside of that. It's now a university town, university city. Um, it's a very, very popular tourist um, attraction in, uh, in the west of Ireland. And the particular Aaron Sweater Market building is right at the end of this very, very uh, important retail street. And when I was talking to my client, I was saying, like, God, um, you know, do you realize this is going to be significant? The cost of re, re bringing this back into economic reuse is going to be very, very significant. And we did, we did a feasibility budget for him and uh, he had done his maths, his, his uh, financial figures done right. And from, me, from him, his point of view, it was the exact location that he wanted from a retail point of view. It was exactly where. So this is just a photograph of what the building looked like um, before we took it over. These are just a couple of shots of what it looked like at the end. Uh, and I'll come back to talking about these. And this is the type of work that we ended up going through in terms of the archaeology. Um, and it was it involved it was a project that involved everything. So before and after, a um, couple of pictures. Uh, this is one part of the, the building, and if we look at it in detail, we have a masonry wall. Uh, but when you start looking at it, you have a brick relieving arch, soft um, clay brick, um, over uh, what was probably a one over one 19th century um, sliding slash window. Same here, this window was blocked up. We look carefully here, this was a door. Uh, and a window into was at some point a residence. Um, but prior to that, you can see a stone arch, which would have indicated that this is an entrance into um, a yard or something at the back of the building. So that was converted. If you look here, 
you can begin to see this is a big opening that was made through the, the masonry wall. But here you can begin to see um, a flat stone arch, which would have indicated probably a window and so on. And the building just slowly but surely, as we walk through it, started to reveal what it, it actually was and all the changes. If we look at it, <clears throat> what we did when we brought back in, we retained that arch. And instead of having it in our entrance, it became a very nice, very big window. Um, again, the flat arch here. Uh, that was a new one we put in, which would have been just here to give a balance. That's the original flat arch, uh, stone sills. Um, the masonry was repaired and raked out and repointed in a, a proper lime base window, or sorry, lime uh, base pointing. Um, but the character of that wall retained as much as possible of the original materials and took advantage of the knowledge we had and developed of what the building was like. If we look at the, uh, the shops, uh, sorry, the Key Street side, you begin, this is what it was like. This is what we ended up with. Um, we had a, what was it, a door and another door here. But in fact, they were originally medieval windows. And you can see the, re the medieval relieving arch here and here. Uh, this is a window, but it was filled in. It was originally when we did the archaeology and opening it up, we found that there was the remnants of a medieval door. So we were able to reintroduce that door. And you can see here, brick, brick, modern um, block wall, beautiful medieval um, dressed pine stones, and so on. So this particular gable had a lot in it that we were able to take advantage of and reinstate. Um, what, what the um, building would have looked like at some point. This particular uh, design of um, a door case and hood molding over it. Um, on the Key Street side, sorry, the Key Lane side, we had remnants of one of these, but we didn't go, we were able to find other examples. So we were able to model this and what was locally agreed or acceptable. We go and look on the inside, you can see this is what we were faced with, raking shore, holding up that gable, um, all of the patched all over the place, bits of brick. Uh, you can see here, at some point, this wall here extended across, so it would have come towards us. That medieval wall was taken out and uh, was patched up with um, uh, masonry and modern OPC, or important cement pointing, which is not a great idea. And you begin to see here where some brick relieving arches, um, and then the introduction of doors and windows into little units. Um, one of the, the things that, that we, we found so interesting was that um, we needed to really understand the building. And this is this here is the example of what was left of uh, a medieval uh, cut stone op door opening. And then you had bits of concrete and brick uh modern black rock and stuff so then, but we had enough here in this to um inform us as to what was was originally there so one of the important things that we had to do initially to understand what was there because it's a, a national sorry a recorded monument and a protected structure and it's also within the architectural uh conservation area within the city we had to do a proper material analysis uh, identify the brickwork, the modern block work, modern window openings with PVC windows, and so on and so on. Uh, so we could get an understanding, and that led to a better understanding of the condition of the materials and the condition and capability structurally of those particular walls. <clears throat> Some of the conservation issues uh, uh, from an engineering point of view was uh, we, based on our assessment of the walls, um, I concluded that uh, the existing walls would not be capable of carrying um, the modern um, structural laws that would have been required in terms of um, a first floor 
um, loadings for a retail outlet and new roofs and stuff. So we looked at various options in terms of the type of um, how we might keep a roof there, how we might support the um, the new in the new requirements in terms of floors, uh, roofs, and tidy original masonry walls. These <clears throat> we looked at an option in terms of a, a steel frame, and also um, looked at an option um, using uh, concrete. <clears throat> Um, the concrete structure within it, and we eventually went with the concrete structure because it gave us far greater flexibility. And the structural engineer on the team, um, he had worked on the building next door to it, so we were able to get our floor levels um, and all of the structure to tie in with the other building next door, which the, our client was in the process of buying to make a, a bigger outlet. But you can see here where uh, we put in a concrete frame. Um, that carried the uh, the new floors, carried the roof. <clears throat> you can see here where uh, it carried the roof, and uh, there was no loadings on the the masonry, the external masonry walls, other than their own weight, and and uh, that worked very. That has worked very very well. Uh, in terms of sequencing, we um, put in the frame, put in the first floor. And then that gave us cover to do the archaeology, which uh, allowed us to do the archaeology in the cover. And then we put on the, the main roof um, before we actually started doing the significant part of the repairs to the masonry, because it gave us um, the option of working within um, basically a covered environment. And uh, we were able to walk right through the winter. Because one of the things that was important was to get the, the building open. Um, for the tourism season, um, and that was part of the economic model, the financial model that our client was in, uh, very, very driven by. Uh, you can see here where you have your uh, concrete uh, structure carrying the crook roof style and also carrying a king cross truss style. Uh, there's two parts of the building that um, uh, exhibited different um, Primarily different uh, types of of masonry, and uh, so we had a, a primarily a, a medieval section where we decided uh, we put on a crook roof to, um, I suppose, to complement that. And on the other side, in the 18th, 19th century style, which we put in a, a king cross truss roof. And uh, that king cross truss roof uh, was a very important feature because it allowed on such a very narrow site, uh, people to be drawn up onto the first floor. In terms of archaeology, um, it proved an extremely interesting site. We, we worked on the archaeology um, undercover, um, and the archaeologists found um, on this here, they found some old medieval drains. They found uh, what was the original foundations of the um, Galway Castle or Cashlaw and the Galway, which it's, it's known as in Gaelic. Um, it had, they found the original shoreline of the, region, of the uh, River Corrib. And it was um, a very important archaeological find, so much so that um, the archaeological team um, were literally damned by people coming, wanting to volunteer to work on this site. And of course, it's such a, a small, narrow site um, that, you know, for all sorts of reasons, you couldn't accommodate that much as you would like to do. Um, here, with just some of the outcome of the, the archaeology, we found all the various different mullion and transoms um, in terms of medieval uh, designs of uh, trace um, styles in terms of the the, um, the the window and door ropes. And um, this is piece here is a, a new piece that we were trying to match in terms of the finishes. And you can see here different types of very uh, comb finishes that were on the original um, medieval stonework. And we got the builder, um, Sean, to make up a, a sandbox for us where we, myself, 
the archaeologist and the local conservation officer um, spent a couple of hours with a hilarious uh, phone of, of some people they're passing one and what are we doing what are we at? and we created a little beach for ourselves but we, we put in the sand so that we could move the stones and if one of them dropped it wasn't going to break to work out which was the right style that we could all agree on to actually replicate uh, some of the materials this particular 19th century chimney you can see was in a, a, an appalling condition and had been rendered in uh, ordinary Portland cement plaster, um, had cracked, had failed, uh, probably a couple of uh, fires in the flues had um, caused the, the major problems, structural problems in it. So we had to um, take it, take it down primarily. And you can begin to see where the, the original brick was just completely um, shot from um, the chimney fires and, and moisture. You can see here where there was a line of a crack in the, um, the render and water just got in. So we managed to salvage some brick and you can see we ended up taking it down way significantly taking it down and then um, rebuilding it. Um, the debates that went on with the conservation officer were very, interesting um he, di he didn't really want us to, to do a lot to this but it was structurally um, totally unsafe and we had to make it safe um in terms of the, the different skills stone masons you can see here this is an original piece of a, a mullion and then we were trying to have a uh, the um the window the base of the window dressed and matching in uh, and it took some time to get that and the, the um, to find the right stone mason. This is a completely modern uh, replica of a, a window surround again, but you can see the type of detailing that was um, decided and worked out so that the, the building actually uh, represented and was in character and was at the right period. Services engineering, uh, very interesting how we got the services in. Um, we ended. We decided that the best form of heating in the building, um, after looking at a number of options, was um, to have an underfloor heating system. And the um, concrete floors were ideal for this, and finished in uh, a stone flag. This allowed the building to have a, more or less a, a, a continuous temperature uh, that works very well in all the buildings. Um, but you can start to see here how the services are being introduced in a way that they're not impacting on the original building at all. We managed to find a way to do that. Um, in terms of windows, uh, in trying to keep in, in terms of the character of the 19th century side of the building, which is here, and then on the medieval side, um, you can see this 19th century uh, one over one slide, up and down sliding sash window uh, with the brick head and the, the relieving arch. Uh, and down here, you'd have had a much earlier uh, flat stone arch. And then on this medieval side, you would have had the, uh, the stone relieving arch, but the um, cut stone uh, window and um, bronze window with uh, leaded came glass. Quite different in character. This particular photograph is just is of a, a flat stone arch, but it's um, it's more visual than anything. Um, we went on this because went with this because we wanted to demonstrate that it looked visually looked like a flat stone arch, but it's actually one piece of stone carved to look like um, separate stones. And we dated this um, on a underneath as well. So that in later years, people interpreting the building uh, would understand what went on. Fitting out, the fitting out of the, the, the building um, was moving on uh, quite rapidly as well, because what the style of the fitting out, uh, where we were able to hide and screen all of the concrete structure using timber uh, or reused uh, railway sleepers and so on. Um, that allowed us to hide all of the, the electrical services, the common services um, within 
the, the, the fit house, not impacting on the original fabric. Uh, this particular area here is where we um, kept an opening in the floor near one of the, the, um, the retail points uh, so that people could actually see the foundations of the original Galway, um, the, the castle as part of the experience in the shop. So the outcome, uh, it went from what we saw earlier, an absolute uh, ruinous building to this particular building, um, which uh, I'm glad to say the owner was absolutely spot on in terms of its retail possibilities. Um, I. At one stage, they were staying open to 11 o'clock every night because of the level of trade. But you can see it's full of retail merchandise, the arm sweaters, um, and it is proving to be a very successful project. Uh, you can see where you know, that big arched window, crop roof style, there's our concrete. So it's um, no longer, you know, it, it's part of the character. It's blended in uh, so that you don't see it as concrete. We see it as part of the, the finishes in the building. The lighting, um, the, the style of the, the, the roof. Here, this is a, a dividing wall. Between, and um, rather than just taking down the dividing wall, we kept significant part of the dividing wall. But some of the characteristics that we kept to some of these protruding stones and give it a very, very interesting um, feeling. And these are uh, kept where, you know, health and safety of visitors and, and uh, staff and stuff are taken into consideration. So how do we overcome the challenges? Well, I suggest that the following are a list of strategies you should be thinking about. Um, <clears throat> we need to absolutely understand the building and we need to, Get that because that's our that's our um, that's the materials for baking the cake in in other words. Uh, we need to understand its history. Not that we want to be historians, but we understand its history, so we understand the materials, we understand the technologies, uh, we understand the um, the type of um, history that influenced the building and why it has changed and so on. If that does have a a uh, big impact on our understanding of the materials and the technologies that we use. We need to have a very good uh, understanding through the use of those okay. Excuse me. Uh, um, we need to understand uh, the current condition and work on all the engineering challenges that we're going to face. Um, so that's understanding the building. We need to recognize the economic reality up front. Uh, our client in this particular case is a businessman. He recognized the um, economic reality. And the first thing we did with him was to do a feasibility study. We looked at the finances, we looked at the building, we looked at the opportunity that was there. And once he was happy that it was financially possible within certain constraints in terms of timetable and meeting, um, you know, having the shop open for a, a tourism season and so on, and getting the budgets right. Um, the particular economic model that he used made sense. Um, then we, we had to make sure we had the right professionals on board, the right contractor on board, um, so that we didn't have a situation where um, we had people that didn't understand what they were doing. We had a team that understood, had worked together for years, um, and understand historic buildings. Uh, we had great buy-in from our clients. This is something that is absolutely important. And we had to work with getting buy-in from the other stakeholders, such as the planning authority, uh, the national monuments people in Dublin, um, the local business community, um, the local chamber of commerce and so on. You need to be prepared to educate people in the various authorities. Bear in mind that you're going to know more about that particular building than anyone if you spend time. Um, the local conservation officer, heritage officer, planner, they'll have a general understanding of what's in their area. But you'll need to, you'll need to work with them and educate them about the particular building they're working on. 
I would suggest you need to be very flexible. You need to be realistic. You need to be prepared to compromise. What I mean by compromise, you need to know what, what's, you need to have the stuff identified that you can compromise on. You need to know what, to, what is highly significant, but that there is no uh, you know, room for compromise. So that it's a trade-off. And the more information you have on that, the better. I would suggest that modern technologies and modern materials and all technology and materials are not really compatible. We can get them to work together beside each other. And um, we need to, you know, really understand and design the um, the zone that's from one to the other, the transition between. Um, but we're very good at that. Uh, but they don't mix directly very, very easily. And our approach is that the building essentially is our client. We need to, we speak for the building. Why do I take this approach and have I promoted it for you as well? If we can get the building right and serve the building, well, then the people that are putting the money up and putting the uh, the time and effort and using it as their home or as their retail outlet or as their museum or whatever it is, that will work, um, provided the building is, is done right. So I've just come to the end and said thank you very much. Um, and just a photograph here of, of uh, myself and Nancy and uh, some members from some of the eminent people from CAVE and so on and Brian and from Tobins when we were uh, at the Built Environment 2019 Awards. So thank you very much. Uh, Rosemary, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you very much, David. Indeed, that's a very interesting presentation. It's just nice to see such a derelict building being preserved and brought back to life rather than being uh, demolished or replaced with something that's certainly not as aesthetic to look at. Um, we do have one question that's come in, if you're able to answer. In England and Wales, we have the new Building Safety Act. Do you see any problems in meeting much higher standards retaining historic buildings for habitation? Uh, they mentioned this, they're involved a few years ago with converting a historic biscuit factory with the new requirements that large windows would not get approval today. I'm not familiar with the with the new regulation uh, that's coming in. Um, I know we're, we're here in Ireland, uh, it's there's new regulations coming in as well that um, need to be need to be worked with. Um, I think with with uh, people taking a fair and realistic approach to these things, um, we can find that there is a way forward. But sometimes, um, you know, regulations can actually be to the detriment of, of all the buildings. And that's where I, I believe the professional organizations such as CABE um, should be inputting into, into these particular um, discussions at a very, very early stage, you know, during the point where um, the new regulations are in draft or, and um, that's where I think professionals dealing with all the buildings and indeed modern buildings um, have a great influence um, to be able to input. So I'm sorry I'm not able to comment any more than that because I'm not familiar with, with those particular regulations as to what's coming in. Okay, thank you very much, David. Um, I've got no other questions coming in at the moment. Um, so I'd like to thank David and thank everyone who's joined us this morning. Uh, just to remind you, the session has been recorded. Uh, and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel soon uh, and the link will be sent to all of those who have uh, participated today. Um, if there is anyone that's viewed today's session and thinks it would benefit a colleague, please do share the link with them so they can catch up at their leisure. And if you get any feedback on webinars or any sessions you'd like to see us cover, any specific topics, regulations or anything industry related you think would make a good 40 to 50 minute presentation, please get in touch. Alternatively, if you think you yourself could present one of our webinars, Again, get in touch because we love to have people join us and uh, set up some new ones for the coming months. So with that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you again for your time and we'll hopefully see you again next month at the next webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rosemary, thank you for organising it. <laughs>